Good morning and welcome to Trinity on the sixth Sunday of Epiphany. Would you join us for worship beginning on page 355? Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord be with you, kneeling, let us pray. <clears throat> o God, the strength of all who put their trust in you, mercifully accept our prayers. And because in our weakness we can do nothing good without you, give us the help of your grace, that in keeping your commandments we may please you both in will and deed, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. The first reading is from the book of Deuteronomy. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord, your God, then I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances. Then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish, and you shall not live in the land that you are crossing, Jordan, to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before your life and death blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and holding fast to him, for that, that means life to you and length days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. The word of the Lord. The reading is from Psalms. Happy are they whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Happy are they who observe his decrees and seek him with all their hearts, who never do any wrong, but always walk in his ways. You laid down your commandments that we should fully keep them. 
Oh, that my ways were made so direct that I might keep your statutes. Then I should not be put to shame when I regard all your commandments. The second reading is from the book of Corinthians. And so, brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now, you are still not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For as long as there are jealousies and quarreling among you, you are not of the flesh, and behaving according to human inclinations. For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose, and each will receive wages according to the labor of each. For we are God's servants, working together. You are God's field, God's building. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable of judgment. But I say that if you are angry with your brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother, 
or a sister, you'll be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you'll be liable to hell of fire. So when you are offering your gifts at the altar, if you remember that your brother or your sister has something against you, leave your gifts there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gifts. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go to hell. It is also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife accepts on the grounds of unchastity causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, and your no, no. And anything more, this comes from evil one. The Gospel of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts, be pleasing to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, good morning. As we continue making our way through Epiphany, we have this interesting passage right out of the gates in the Gospel. We mentioned it a little bit last week when I talked about the you have heard it said statement. You've heard it said, if you have hate in your heart, you've murdered. If you've had lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. And on and on. And these are all really great statements. They're right. They're good. They're true. They're part of God's law, actually. And if we could live according to it, it would be wonderful. But the unfortunate thing is, every one of us, we hold hate in our heart, whether we like it or not. We have anger in our heart. We have lust in our heart. We don't always let our yes be yes and our no be no. And if we only take Jesus' teaching as the life source, we're up a creek. But if we take Jesus for why he came, which was to save us with his life and his blood and his death and his resurrection, well, that's a whole other story. If we could be saved by his teaching, then he would have simply given us teachings and inspired us to follow them and left it at that. But if that's merely our message, then his shed blood, his death, his resurrection was all in vain. Now, be sure, Attempting to live out the ethics of Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount is an admirable thing. Don't get me wrong. I said a moment ago, it's a good thing. In fact, we, if we could live out this ethic, then the world would be a perfect, harmonious place. In other words, God's law, the way that he said we should live, is good. But there's a problem. We're not good. We can't keep God's law perfectly, and we won't keep his law perfectly. Just look at Gandhi or any of the other prophets of recent. They could not do it. This can lead us to two places. We can try to disarm God's holy law. I think Jesus might be saying this or that or something else, wink, wink. So I'll just try my best and hopefully he'll make up the rest. I'll give 50% and he'll give 50% and He'll take care of the rest. I'll just do my part. 
there's a problem. This negates the cross of Christ. If Jesus came just to give us a mulligan, or a little encouragement, or a little advice on how to live the victorious life, then why in the world did he have to suffer and shed his blood and die? You see, friends, my problem requires much more than a mulligan or a do-over with a little help from Jesus. Jesus simply doesn't give us this option. My problem is not that I just need a little help or I need to try a little harder. My problem is that I'm guilty and condemned and dead. I'm dead in my sins and my trespasses. So here's another option. When we get, read the passage, we can read it like this. A, trampling, a, a trembling confession. We could say, I'm guilty. Or if we want to be a little more eloquent, we can say with Isaiah, when he had his vision of God's righteous throne, woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. When we're living in a place of honesty about who we are and how we react, when we're confronted with God and his holy law, wow, woe is me. And then the most honest prayer follows normally, help. That's the most honest prayer there is, help. Now, I want us all to come to terms with what Jesus is saying here. I want to do it in light of what he said in our gospel passage last week. Remember how he said it last week? Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teachings and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So I'm not going to explain it away. I'm not going to explain his teachings as this or that or reduce them to an action step. Rather, I want us to see just how high and lofty and lifted up the holy of holy is, how holy these commandments really are. I want us to come to a better realization of just how far we are from those commandments. Why? Because in order for us to stop relying on ourselves and our own righteousness and start relying on Jesus and his righteousness as a gift to us, in order to discourage you from more navel-gazing and encourage you to look outside yourself to something better, to Jesus for your salvation. So in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus ups the ante. He's showing us that it's not just outward acts of anger or promiscuity or immorality or dishonesty that's the problem. It's actually an inward thought or posture and feeling. It's an emotion that are probably too big for us. Sin is not simply an outward act of rebellion or omission. Sin is an inward condition at the core of our being a condition of utter and complete self-centeredness, a condition of complete idolatry. I want to be God. A condition which brings us eternal judgment and death. If sin is just outward acts of rebellion, then the only strong and disciplined will survive because they can save themselves by deleting those bad behaviors from their lives and adding good behaviors instead. But if sin is an incurable condition at the core of our being under which all of us suffer, then we all need a Savior who is not us. Someone who can be strong enough and loving enough to save us from our horrible condition. What does our condition produce? Well, it produces anger. Ever surprise you yourself with thoughts of unspeakable violence towards someone you don't like? Perhaps a co-worker or a Family member, what does Jesus have to say about it? Here's what he says. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to hellfire. What else does it produce? Our condition produces lust. Ever surprise yourself? with unspeakable sexual thoughts and desires about someone? What does Jesus say about that? But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. It also produces divorce. What does Jesus say about divorce? But 
I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery himself. It also produces lies. Ever surprised yourself in the midst of a lie, and not just a little white lie, but a whopper? What does Jesus say about lies? Let what you simply say simply be yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. After all this, every month should be shut before our holy God. Every mouth whoop, shut down. Not a single solitary argument for our own innocence can be made. And that goes for all of us. We are all in the same boat, guilty and condemned as murderers and adulterers and liars. But I have some good news for us guilty sinners. Jesus. He is the good news. Jesus has compassion for us in our horrible condition. Jesus has compassion for us in the midst of our flaws and sins and rebellions and inability and our unwillingness to do what he commands. While we still were sinners, the scripture says, Jesus, what? He gave us some insight for living, inspired us to live right? No. He knew that was all a lost cause. He knew that we could not save ourselves through more insightful, victorious, glorious Christian living because the horrible inward condition would still be there. That would be like throwing a drowned man two 50-pound dumbbells while yelling at him, here, work out your arms a little more. They'll get stronger and you'll be able to swim to shore. That's cruel. It's insane. And it represents what being preached in the pulpit across America all over the place. And it's wrong. It's not helpful. Jesus knew that no amount of ethical living could save us from judgment and death. So what did he do? Lay down even more ethics? No. While we were still weak, while we were still sinners, while we were his guilty enemies, while we were dead in our sins and trespasses, Christ died for the ungodly. That's us. That is the real merciful compassion work of Jesus coming to us. He shed his blood and died. He took all of our sins on himself. All of our anger, all of our lust, all of our toxicity that leads to broken relationship, all of our lies and has truths, and even the condition from which all of this sin flows. He took those things away from us and put them on himself. The Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all, the scripture says. And he died in our place, the death we deserved. And he defeated death for us. And he reconciled us back to God, against whom we ourselves had rebelled. He looks with great love and compassion on our sin. He looks at our corpse and he breathes new life into us. So fellow guilty and uncondemned, murderer and adulterer and liar, hear what Jesus says. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, he died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Our sins, which are many, have been forgiven. He does not count our trespasses against us anymore. You have been made right before God through the blood of Jesus. Not because you kept Jesus' ethical teaching pretty well, quite the opposite. But because someone else won all of that for you in his life, death, burial, and resurrection. In other words, Jesus, drop the charges. You're forgiven. Now go and be the forgiven creature you were created to be, loved and accepted. Amen. Now that we have heard the good news,
Let us stand and profess what we know to be true through the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of his Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Before we offer gifts at the altar, let us offer prayers for all our sisters and brothers in the church and the world who need justice, mercy, and reconciliation. For the Church of Jesus Christ throughout the world, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For Mark, our bishop, for priests and deacons, for all who minister in Christ, and for all the people of God, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For those chosen to govern peoples and nations and for the welfare of their people, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all who suffer from any form of oppression and for the hungry and homeless, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all who rest in Christ, for all the departed, especially those whom we name now in our hearts, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For ourselves and for our families and all those we love, especially those named on our par parish prayer list, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Remembering all the saints, let us offer ourselves and one another to the living God through Christ. Amen. Amen. Loving God, who commands us to do what is right and good, hear the prayers we offer you this day that all peoples may approach your holy table in peace and unity. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all of your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's Amen. greet each other in peace. Good morning. I'm so glad you're joining us in the virtual service, I hope. It meant as much to you as it did me. I love joining you each week here at Trinity, even if just through a computer lens or a iPhone. I hope you'll join us as we come to the table in just a moment. A couple of quick announcements I'll bring to your attention. We are coming to the end of Epiphany, moving into Lent very soon. 
lots happening in the life of the church. I hope you'll join us, hopefully live. You're welcome to any of our services coming down the road. You're also welcome to join us here on the virtual service as well. So here's the deal. Jesus really dropped the charges for you. That's right. There's an old spiritual that was sung. You should Google it. Jesus dropped the charges. It's a wonderful seven-minute video of the whole idea of Jesus dropping the charges that were against us. And they were dropped for you. And we're reminded of that every single week when we come to this table. When I hold up that host, it truly reminds us that all of our charges were put on Jesus and he died. He paid the full price 100%. And then we take that cup of wine reminding us that we are clean. We are washed 100% clean. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who call on Jesus. So I invite you, come to this table and receive afresh and anew. I also invite you to consider giving to this parish. If you'd like to do so, you can follow the prompt here in the bottom of the screen. And I'll remind you of the words of Jesus who said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Come to the table. Jesus is your host. All things come of thee, O Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, 
our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mysteries of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. you please join me for our post-communion prayer. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. And now, may the peace of God be on each one of you this day, and until we meet again, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us go forth into the world, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit, Alleluia, alleluia.